Amen. Let us go to our Father in prayer. God, you are who you say you are. You can do what you say you can do. I am who you say I am. I can do all things through Christ. Your word is alive and active in me. Most high God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The creator of the heavens and the earth and the fullness thereof. The Alpha, the Omega. The beginning and the end. All there is, all there was, all there will be. The Almighty. Abba. Abba, Abba. The one that ordained this very moment. The one that knew me before I was formed in my mother's womb. The giver of all good and perfect gifts. The one who gave his only begotten son for the remission of sins and salvation of souls. Gracious Father, shine your face upon us that we may be saved. Forgive me for all have sinned and fell short of your will and your glory. Father, no name is higher than yours, and you are worthy of our praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your peace, joy, and purity, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, abundance, awareness, and expansion. But most of all, Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus, who went to the cross on Calvary died for our sins and remission and redemption of our souls. Father, I thank you for him going away to prepare a place for us to come back to receive us to his very own. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit that abides within us each and every day, guiding us, leading us in the direction that you would have us to go. Father, I thank you for the archangels, the ministering angels, all the angels that watch over us and guide us each and every day. Father, I pray for peace in Jerusalem. Now, Father, I ask you to pray, bless this house, the house of St. Frederick's this, this evening, Father. Bless each and every member, touch of each and every heart. Open our minds and our souls that we may receive of you, Father. Father, speak to me and speak through me, that your word may go forth and penetrate the hard souls and minds that need to hear from you this evening, Father. Father, we just ask you to just bless us and keep us. Wrap your arms around us, keep us in the hedge of protection. In the name of Yeshua, Hamasiah, Sashalom, Amen, Amen, and Amen. All right. Tonight's lesson, Truth and Love. Truth and Love. Two very important concepts in our daily living that we need to have in order to sustain life, to sustain, a quality, to sustain a quality life. The author writes, there are two extremely misconceptions about many people who, ha who have concerning what it means to be a Christian or to live a Christian life. One of the views says, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere and loving. The other says, it doesn't matter how you live as long as you believe the truth. The reason both views are just as wrong is because the word of God binds both truth and love and separately together. They are friends and not enemies. You cannot have truth without love. You can't have love without truth. So the, the discussion question tonight is, the group discussion is, have you ever been in a situation where you felt torn between doing the right thing and the loving thing? And my answer today is, yeah. There are many times where you know what's right, but in order to do what's right, it's gonna hurt somebody's feelings. And if you do the loving thing, it's not always the right things in some people's eyes. 
So when you come to that situation, it's not always easy to weigh out. But if you're doing things truthfully and lovingly, you cannot go wrong. When you do things in truth and in love, you cannot go wrong. How do we worship God? There's only one way we can worship our God. That's in spirit and in truth. And if we are connected, the way we've been talking about for the past few weeks, if we are connected to God, we have that intimacy, so we're surrounded by love. All right? So the personal reflection question asks, would you identify yourself as someone who truth needs to be balanced by love or one who needs their love balanced by truth? Do you need your truth to be balanced by love or do you need your love to be balanced by truth? Make you think for a second. Can you just go through life living and loving without truth? Which would allow any and everything to go on because you're given love or do you just deal with love or deal with truth with no compassion. All right. So our lesson tonight comes from the second epistle of John. To John. And I'll be reading again from the complete Jewish Bible. Starting at verse 1. From the elder to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in truth. Not only I, but also all those who have come to know the truth. Because of the truth which remains within us, we will be and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and shalom will be with us from God the Father and from Yeshua the Messiah, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I was very happy when I found some of your children living in truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am requesting that we love one another. Not as if we, not as, not as if this were a new command in my writing to you, for this one which we have had from the beginning. Moreover, Love is this, that we should live according to his commands. This is the command, as you people have heard from the beginning, live by it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, people who do not acknowledge Yeshua, the Messiah, coming as a human being. Such a person is a deceiver and an anti-Messiah. Watch yourselves so that you won't lose what you have worked for but you receive your full reward. Everyone who goes ahead and does not remain true to the Messiah, to what the Messiah has taught, does not have God. Those who remain true to his teachings have brought have both the Father and the Son. If someone sees, if someone comes to you and does not bring you this teaching, do not welcome them in your home. Don't even say shalom to him. For the person who says shalom to him shares in his evil deeds. Although I have much to write you people, much to write you people, I, all, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come and see you and to talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of her chosen sister send you their greetings. John was writing. He drops them a note to let them know that he's thinking about them and that he wants to personally come see them. He addresses it to the elect lady and her children. He's speaking metaphorically. He isn't writing to a specific lady but he's writing to a church. He uses the feminine because the church is the bride of Christ. And we'll find that in Revelations 22, 17. 
he is calling the members of the church her children. John is making this very personal and very familiar. We're talking about again that horizontal, horizontal fellowship. Okay? John says the church is the one he loves in truth. There are two great biblical realities. Truth and love. They must be tied together. They balance one another out. They cannot be separated. Truth without love is cold orthodoxy. In other words, it's just cold, authorized, generally accepted theory, doctrine, or a practice. It's just what you do. It's just cold. All you do is do it because that's what you do. Love without truth is empty. Sentimentalism is excessive expressions of feelings of tenderness, sadness, or nostalgia in the behavior, writing, or speech. The fact of the matter is, love is truth in action. In other words, when you show in love to a person, you are truly being who you are. When you are showing love and compassion, you are truly doing the will of God. Truth is love. Love is truth in action. Truth is very important to John. He talks about it five times in the first four verses. Truth has come fallen hard these last, these last few years. Uh, today, it, 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 it's whatever my truth, your truth, whose truth. But the fact of the matter is, truth is non-negotiable for Christians and believers. The truth is the truth. No matter how you break it down, it is just the truth. Truth is what corresponds with reality. It is what it is. And is rooted in the Most High. God is the absolute standard which truth is measured by. Truth is what God says about something. It doesn't matter what we feel, what we hope, what we think, what we want, anything else. The truth is what God says it is. When God declares it, it's the truth. It's the revealed word of God that speaks the truth about life, death, heaven and hell, money and parenting, parenting, marriage and sex, and anything else that brings life big questions. So relativity does not matter. We must stand for the truth. When we get to verses 3 through 6, we look at grace, mercy, and peace, shalom. Grace, mercy, and shalom will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ. The blessings that come from grace, mercy, and peace, you can't get them anywhere else. You can't buy them in Walmart. I can't give it to you. You, you, can't, you can't coax it out of a rock. You can't talk your way into it. You can't talk your way out of it. It comes from God. It comes from Christ. You can't get them nowhere else. But there's a, there's a caveat. There, there's something else that goes along with that. If there is no love and truth, you're not going to experience God's grace, mercy, and peace fully. Believers must walk in truth. We have to walk in truth. John writes that he was glad to see things, see, those, see this when he was uh, writing this epistle, that children of that church were walking in the truth. And as long as they're walking in the truth, that means they are aligned with the Holy Spirit. And when we are in alignment with God, that means we're not just a satellite Christian tuning in just on Sunday morning. That means we have a connection that is current. That means that we have intimacy 
We've been talking about intimacy. Where there's no intimacy, we're dealing strictly with legality. God never gives you a blessing when we contaminate his truth. In other words, we can't pervert. We can't change the truth to suit us and expect to be blessed by God. It ain't going to happen. God is not going to bless us in our mess. Okay? You're not going to get blessed in your mess, no matter how you look at it. You cannot contaminate God's truth. We walk in truth. In other words, when we are living according to the word of God and keeping God's commands, then we are walking in truth. Otherwise, we just walk. The chief command after loving God is to love one another. And again, we go back to that horizontal love. We've been talking about vertical love, us loving God, God loving us. But he told us to fellowship with one another and love one another horizontally. How are we going to love who we have not seen when we can't love our brothers and sisters who we do see? Well, question comes to mind, what have we been called to do? Quite simple, walk in love. The church, believers, Christians are to be the incubator for the truth. In other words, when a newborn baby is born, a, new, a baby is born, it's put in the incubator to keep it warm to begin that growth process. Well, the growth process for truth begins within believers, within Christians, within the family of God. We don't, we, 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 we're not here to have our ears tickled, to hear something good, to hear what we want to hear. But we are to preserve, hear, and speak the truth. We are the family of God. And our Heavenly Father has set family standards. As the family grows, so do problems. The test of a true believer, of a true church, of a true Christian, is not if it has problems, but when those problems arise, do we address it by God's standard of truth? Do we address our issues as a Christian family, as a body of Christ? Do we address our issues using God's standard of truth? Or are we using the worldly standard? Everything must be done in love. We cannot walk in truth if we don't walk in love. We cannot walk in truth if we don't walk in love. The most high desires that we deal compassionately, righteously, and responsibly and seek the well-being of our fellow brothers and sisters. Then we look at verse 7. And then we talk about the deception and those that are deceiving out in the world. Have you ever watched David Blaine, or any other illusionists. We have those that are out in the world that are using sleight of hands or a sleight of word. They remove a word here and remove a word there, place a word here, place a word there in order to deceive you with an illusion that you are serving or worshiping God when you have fallen into something that is not of God because they are denying who Christ is. John is warning us about those who will try to deceive us. He ain't talking about pulling the rabbit out of the hat. He ain't talking about David Blaine. Um, he's not talking about a magic show. He's talking about those people who do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. In other words, not believing or not teaching that though the word of God took on human form and came to earth himself. That God came himself to do what he needed to do. Truth is measured 
by what people conclude about Jesus Christ. But he's in a class all by himself. Slight of tongue. Amen, Brother Hank. Slight of tongue. He's in a class all by himself. It don't matter how well a person speaks, how eloquently they dress, how many causes they stand up for, how much money they give to the poor, how many, how many babies they rescue from fires. If they are teaching anything other than Jesus Christ is the eternal, eternal son of God, then that's somebody that we don't need to have much to do with. Uh, uh, unless we're talking about the same Jesus who, the same God who became a man that was sinless, that died on the cross to atone for our sins and rose again from the dead, that person teaching that is nothing but a deceiver and the antichrist. John told us about the antichrist and the deceivers were doing during his day, will be doing coming during the great tribulation. Do you want to back that up? Look at Daniel 9, 26 and 27. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3, Revelations 11 and 2, Revelations 13, 1 through 8. But we already have little antichrist running around trying to use the sleight of tongue, trying to use the sleight of hand, trying to deceive people into believing that there is no Christ or that they are the common chosen one. First John 2.18 talks about that. Who are the Antichrists? They are the ones who oppose or try to replace Jesus Christ. They are busy now, just like they were busy back in John's day. When we go to verses 8 and 9, we see that, and we've been talking about for the longest time that the work that we do here now will be our reward when we get to heaven. We are blessed here, but we don't receive our full blessing in this life. Most of our reward is waiting for us in eternity. But if we are unfaithful and allow ourselves to be tricked, we can lose what God has in store for us and not receive our full reward. Remember, Satan has three things that he wants to do to us. Kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to kill our spirit, steal our joy, and destroy all our hopes. And we cannot allow ourselves to be deceived and not receive our full reward. So what do we do to stop this from happening. How do we prevent ourselves from being deceived? How do we prevent ourselves from losing what God has for us? Well, go back to that word again. Remain. Abide. Stay close to close proximity. That intimacy. When we tune into that signal on a daily basis, when we spend time with the Most High daily, we are in communion, meaning a union, a union. We are a union. We are together. We're connected to the truth, the true vine. We're connected to the true vine so we don't lose anything. How do we do that? Well, if you are close to the teachings of Christ, you remain in his intimacy. You, you can't get close to a fire without getting warm. And you're certainly not going to get close to the teachings of Christ and not develop intimacy. But you have to open up your heart and your mind to receive what he's giving you. And abide in his word. When he give you testing the teachings with the word. Amen. Amen, Brother Hank. Testing the teachings with the word. And abide in his word. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. 
Love your father with your whole mind, body, and soul. Believe that Christ is the Son of God, born, died, and rose again. Now, verse 10 and 11. What about those not teaching Christ? Well, it's quite simple. He said, uh, don't give them shalom. Don't say peace to them. In other words, don't receive them into your home. When we abide in the word, the word abides in you. Amen. That's that hanging out with, rubbing off on, communion. Amen, Brother Hank. Amen. Amen. The one that greets him shares in his evil works. In other words, it's not like it was when John was pre-wrote this. They were outside meeting in fields or they didn't have churches like we have. So they met wherever and they would receive people in their homes. So now with technology being the way it is and things being the way they are, we have to be careful to what we allow to enter into us. What we receive into us. What we accept into us. When we accept it, we open the door for spirits to come in. And we allow them to abide in us. John is warning us not to give ear to those who do not hold the truth of Jesus Christ. He's not saying don't talk to non-believers in order to evangelize them. But those who deny Jesus Christ, you need to shake the dust from your feet and go ahead on. Do not allow them into your house. And your temple is your body. Do not allow them into your heart. Do not allow them into your mind. When you open it, you let them in and then you begin to share with their evil. All right? 12 and 13. John wrote this letter because he felt it was very urgent. And he was given a warning and encouragement to uh, the folks that he was writing to. But in his heart of hearts, and we all know that when you want to do something best, it's best to do it face to face. Because that's where in the ministry, it brings joy. Fellowship brings joy. Isn't this teaching why you're sure so it can bring derision? Yeah. Because there... Well, you, um, did you get a chance to read the opening, um, the opening introduction? Did you get a chance to read the introduction about the two uh, extreme misconceptions that Christians have? You can live any kind of way you want to as long as you believe the truth, or it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere and loving. Yeah, those things bring the vision because we are trying, that brings the vision because what he's teaching us is not to allow any and everything in. And a lot of the teaching right now is saying, do your thing as long as you believe. But that's not the way we're supposed to do. Or it says, or going back to that example again, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere and loving. Yeah, what you believe does matter. Because if you don't believe that Yeshua is the Son of God, Yeshua HaMessiah, the Messiah, is the Son of God, then that avenue is closed to you, which brings a division. Then it doesn't matter how you live as long as you believe the truth. But John has been teaching us all along that the way we present ourselves, the way we are claiming, and if we are in tune with God, we should be a reflection of what God is. There should be no question about who we are. Our divine DNA should be reflected. Yes, this will bring a division, especially if you're not living up to the way that he has commanded us to live. All right. And then he ends by sending greetings from a sister church. So, in the brief introductory address in the greetings, verses 1 through 3, notice how many times... Truth and love are mentioned together. What does it mean to be, to love someone in truth? What does it mean to love someone in truth? Verse 
Love is truth in action. So what does it mean to love someone in truth? All right? To love someone in truth is an action. Is an action. Okay? It's an action. You cannot love without truth. It must be together. Amen, Sister Perry. It must be together. Amen. Amen. All right. We tend to only love those Christians who agree with us or who we feel are compatible with us. But what does it mean to love them because of the truth? When, we love our, when you love your brother, the love of Christ is perfected in you. Yeshua is the truth. He sets the standard for us to love by. Dead on. Hand in hand. And we did talk about, I don't know if you caught it or not, but we did talk about that God set the standard, the family standard for love, the measure by all things which we need to do. Amen. So now what about those who agree with us and we feel compatible with? What does it mean to love because of the truth? When we love because of the truth. Well, think about it. It will be real because when you look at truth, we say truth is reality. Truth is dealing in reality, corresponds with reality. So if we are dealing in reality, and we love somebody because of the truth, we're not being pretentious, we are being real. We're being honest. Nothing phony about it. It's real. All right? Now, how might Christian fellowships, grace, mercy, and peace? Amen. Amen. But can you get grace, mercy, and peace without love and truth? Can you have grace, mercy, and peace without love and truth? And notice what I said. I didn't say without love or truth. I said without love and truth. Can we? The sure will die for the people who put him on the cross, not just his disciples. Oh, so he did that because of the truth. And the truth was he was born, lived for 33 years to go to the cross, to shed his life, to rise again for the sake of us. Amen. And amen, Sister Perry. No, we cannot have love. We cannot have grace, love. Hey, Sister Jackson, you there too. We cannot have grace, mercy, and peace without love and truth. 
Amen. Amen. All right. In verses 4 through 6, the unity of truth and love are applied to our relationships within the church. What distinction is made between the commandment and the commandments? Look at verses 4 through 6. should be out in the world recruiting souls no matter who and where. All right, amen, amen, brother. Hey. Amen. Well, when we're recruiting, are we going to invite certain things in or are we going to shut the door on those things that we don't need to invite in? Are we looking at verses 4 through 6? All right. Verses 4 through 6. I was happy when I found some of your children living in truth, just as the Father commanded us. Now, dear lady, I am requesting that we love one another, not as if this were a new command am I writing you, for it was one which we have had from the beginning. Moreover, Love is this, that we should live according to his commandments. This is the command, as you people have heard from the beginning. Live by it. What's the difference? I was happy when I found some of your children living in truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I'm requesting that we love one another. Not as if it were a new command in my writing you, for it is one which we have had from the beginning. Moreover, love is this, that we should live according to his commands. This is the command. As you people have heard from the beginning, live by it. Light and darkness can't stay together. Keep bad spirits out. All right. All right. Light and darkness cannot share the same space. It's either going to be light or it's going to be dark. So, if we look at the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not have no other gods before me, Thou shalt not make unto thee a graven image, Thou shalt not take the Lord thy God in vain, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, Honor thy mother and thy father, Thou shalt not kill, Thou shalt not commit adultery, Thou shalt not steal, Thou shalt not bear false witness, and Thou shalt not covet. That's what he said. But in that verse, Some of you living in truth just as the Father commanded us. Live in truth. I'm requesting we love one another. Not as if this were a new command, am I writing you, 
for this is one which we had since the beginning. All right? So, how does our obedience to the Ten Commandments, the commandments, help us fulfill the commandment to love one another? And if we love one another, how can we fulfill the Ten Commandments? Is that our word? Or is that a word? Is that a word? The one we've been talking about for a while. That rubbing off. That having a relationship. That intimacy. When we keep God's commandments, we are in tune. We are aligned with him. If we are aligned with him, we are in love. We are operating in love. All right? So if we are keeping the Ten Commandments, and then we keep that commandment to love, it builds our intimacy. It helps us build our intimacy. In verses 7 through 11, the unity of love and truth is applied to our relationships outside the church. By denying Christ that had come in the flesh, what fundamental truths were false teachers rejected? By denying Christ that had come in the, in the flesh, what fundamental truths were false teachers rejected? Look at verse 7. Verse 7. For many deceivers have come, for many deceivers have gone into the world. People who do not acknowledge Yeshua the Messiah coming as a human being. Such a person is a deceiver and an anti-Messiah. Or other words, the, such a person is a liar and an antichrist. So what are they rejecting? What are the false teachers rejected? That Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus is God in the flesh. That's what they're rejecting. So what are some modern counterparts 
to this heresy. heresy. What, what, what else comes out now in the modern day society that we live in that suggests the same thing? Remember, we talked uh, a couple days ago, we said that there was a teaching going around at the time when Jesus, when John was writing this, that when Jesus was baptized, the Holy, when the Holy Spirit descended on him, that's when he received the Christ. And when he went to the grave, that's when the Christ departed. Never, they, they, they refused to acknowledge that the prosperity gospel. Amen. The prosperity gospel. How about new age? New age teachings. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. We on, we, we on the same. That's the ticket. All right. Obtaining a future reward for faithful service was a strong motivation for John. Verse 8. In what sense does that prospect of receiving a reward from Jesus Christ motivate you to walk in truth and love? We all worship the same God. Well, at least we're supposed to. At least we're supposed to. See, some people have some different, um, different views about the Most High God. Remember, some say that he allows us to do whatever we want to as long as we believe the truth. It don't matter how we live. And then there are some people who, um, going back to the beginning, it don't matter what we believe as long as we are sincere. Yeah, dancing with snakes. No, that don't work for me. <laughs> that, that, that don't work for me. <laughs> yeah, that, that's uh, believing whatever you want to believe as long as you're sincere and loving. Yeah, dancing with snakes. Uh, no, no, no. The snake is supposed to be killed. His head is supposed to be bruised underneath my foot. And I'm going to bruise his head every time. So look at the future rewards. Future reward for faithful service. Strong motivation for Brother John. Look at verse 8. In what, in what sense does that prospect of receiving a reward from Jesus Christ motivate you to walk in faith, truth, and love? To walk in truth and love. Sister Jackson? Nope, the Pope says all religions worship the same God. I got news for you. You go back to uh, Psalm 82, when he told them other gods that they were going to die like mortal men. Allah is not the same God. Baal is not the same God. Mogog is not the same God. Ma is not the same God. And I think I named what, five or six? Um, and there's. 65 others that I don't know? <laughs> no, that, that ain't the same God. They were created by the same God. But they're not the same God. Don't be deceived. Exactly. Hey, Sister Jackson, I know you're there. Future rewards. How about a rusty halo, a woolly robe, and a skinny cloud? Anybody working for that? 
that goes back to intimacy and legalism. Legally, when you believe in Christ, you in. You in. Nobody can take that salvation away. But the word said, if we are fooled and deceived, we can lose some of what God has for us because we've been unfaithful. Yes, to love one another. What you mean what? <laughs> In what sense does, receive, does the prospect of receiving a reward, reward from Jesus Christ to, for you to walk in truth and love? And I ask, what about that rusty halo, woolly robe, and that skinny white cloud? Because we allow ourselves to be deceived out of what God has for us because we became unfaithful. Satan comes for three things, John 10.10, 10, to kill, steal, and destroy. But God, Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. When we start doing and living the way we are supposed to live, we will receive a portion of our abundance, abundance now. But the most of what we're going to receive is going to be when we get home. Unless we allow ourselves to be killed, stolen, or destroyed. All right? All right. In the view of the fact that false these false teachers were traveling about from place to place, what specifically is being prohibited in verses 9 and 10. Look at verses 9 and 10. They had these false teachers traveling about everywhere, all over the land at that particular time. What were they not supposed to do when they showed up at their house? Was specifically rusty halo. Amen. Verses 9 and 10. Everyone who goes ahead and does not remain true to what the Messiah has taught does not have God. Spiritual darkness. All right. Those who remain true to his teachings have both the Father and the Son. If someone comes to you and does not bring his teachings, do not walk on him into your home. Don't even say shalom to him. Shalom is peace. Don't, 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 don't even give him peace. Don't let him in your house. Don't give him peace. But now, since we don't live in the same situation they lived in, and we got all this technology going on, what do we need to do? How do we need to govern ourselves accordingly to, to, uh, not invite in and give a foothold to the evil one. Brother Hank said um, earlier, the Pope says, we all serve the same God. Allah. Hmm. Allah, Yahweh, Allah, and Adonai are not the same God. Adonai and Yahweh is the same God. Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, that's the same God. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, Shah Shalom, 
the Prince of Peace, that's the same God. That's the God we serve. Allah, Buddha, Krishna, uh, Baal, Gilgamesh, the Nuki, Kalu, I'm naming gods now. These are all gods from different religions. The Akalu, the Mesopotamians, the Anuki, the same time period. These are all different gods. They are not the God of the Bible. They are not Yahweh. They are not Adonai. They are not El Shaddai. No, those are not. Those are not who we're supposed to worship. So, how does the reasoning of verse 11 help you to follow through on these instructions? Verse 11, for the person who says shalom to him shares in his evil deeds. That's verse 11. Scripture says don't say their names. All right. But then they say don't even say shalom. Don't even say peace. Don't let them in. So if we know if we got somebody, you watching TBN, and they got someone that's preaching something other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. If they're teaching that Christ did not rise again for the remission of our sin and salvation of our soul, if they're teaching us that Christ was just another prophet, is that someone we need to entertain? Because if you ask a devout Muslim, they will tell you, we love Jesus. He was a great prophet. He's not the Messiah. He's a great prophet. I had a gentleman tell me when I was teaching school in Baltimore City, there have been eight other Madonnas before Christ. I'm not accepting him. Eight other Madonnas. So how does the reasoning in that, if a person, when you say shalom, you're sharing his evil deeds, don't invite. Hmm, how many of you going to let, how many of you married women are going to knowingly let someone that's after your husband in your house? And how many of you married men going to knowingly let a man that's after your wife in your house? None. How many of you going to let somebody that's trying to hurt your favorite dog in your yard? None. Now we're talking about our soul. We're talking about eternity. And a gift. The reward that God has from us. We don't want to get tangled up in that evilness. All right? All right. What can you do to gain a better balance of love and truth in your relationships? Is he breathing? 
Amen. What can you do to gain a better balance of love and truth in your relationships? Can we have love without truth? No. And if we try to practice love without truth, what do we say we have? Cold orthodoxy. Authorized, generally accepted theory, doctrine, or practice. Love without truth is empty. Truth and love are tied together. They must balance each other out. Cannot be separated. Truth without love is cold. Authorized or generally accepted theory, doctrine, and practice. Love without truth is empty sentimentalism. An excessive, an excessive meaning too much, expression of feelings, of tenderness, sadness, and nostalgia, nostalgia in behavior, writing, or speech. Love is truth in action. So, what can you do? What can we do to better balance love and truth in our relationships? Keep your relationship with the Lord faithful always. Oh, communion. You talk about intimacy. Divine intimacy, that vertical love. But once we do that, we got to have what? That horizontal love. Amen. Or uh, are we going to be satellite? Well, I know you ain't satellite. So that's why I said it. I know you ain't satellite. No, we're not going to just tune in once a week. We're going to keep a constant connection. We're going to get rubbed off on. He's going to abide on the inside. Because light and dark cannot operate in the same space. Amen. Keep our relationship faithful with the Lord always. Amen. Thank you, Sister Jackson. Pastor, you got anything? No, I'll be late. Yeah. All right. All right. So we're going to end there. Uh, we pick up Monday night with uh, 3 John, opening our hearts and homes, the third epistle of John, and that will close out this section that we've been working on on John, be our 12th lesson, opening our hearts and our homes. Anybody have anything for me? All hearts and minds clear. Let us go to our Father in prayer and give thanks. Hallelujah to the King. Amen. The highest praise. Most high God, we thank you for allowing us to come together. Father, thank you for speaking to me and speaking through me. Father, thank you for moving aside my ego and your word flowing through me this evening. Father, I thank you for touching hearts, souls, and minds, for touching my heart, my soul, and my mind this evening, Father. I ask you to bless each and every household represented here tonight. Lift us up where we need lifting, Father. Touch our, touch our daily lives, Father. Keep us wrapped in your hedge of protection. Father, we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray for our pastor this evening, Father. Touch him and his family. Keep him in your hedge of protection. Love him. Guide him, our under-shepherd, Father, that he will do your will in the name of Jesus. We thank you this evening. Amen, amen, and amen. Good night, all.